Well, last week, Pastor Jill started our series, Unlocking the Parables. And she spent some time talking about the best way to understand the parables. And if you haven't had a chance to review Pastor Jill's sermon, you really need to. So go to our Noblesville First YouTube channel, find that message, take time to watch it. It's worth your time. She does such a tremendous job talking about our tendency to treat parables like allegories. So we tend to decode the parable, decide the human wisdom within it, and then we lay it aside or put it on the shelf, not letting it really impact our lives. Pastor Jill encouraged us to see the parables as short stories told in the everyday language of the ordinary people of Galilee in Jesus' day. When we hear them right, they challenge, they entertain, they actually force us to use our imagination to integrate the truth that is to be experienced. She encouraged us to make the effort to hear them first as the Jewish people who would be sitting at the feet of Jesus. Jill suggested that if we're to hear these parables well, they should leave us at least a little uncomfortable or take us out of our comfort zone. So let me reinforce what Jill is suggesting. Parables are not just little pearls of wisdom intended to provide some moral encouragement to us. If you read them with the eyes of faith, they will engage you and transform you. One of the best ways I've found to grasp the truth of these parables as they were intended to be shared by Jesus is to look for the surprise. In almost every one of these short stories of Jesus, there's something that would have shocked his original audience. Now, that's not always easy to find because sometimes our world is so different from Jesus' world, it's hard to understand that context, to unlock that meaning. But when you do so, it's worth it. I found at least three surprises, three surprises in the midst of this very short parable. The first surprise is one that you're only going to catch if you read this scripture in the original Greek. Most of our Bible translations say the, mer the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant. But Matthew's initial identification of the key person in this parable is not a merchant, but a person. Here's what the Greek actually says. The kingdom of heaven is like a man, comma, a merchant. So that has significance in a couple ways. First, the fact that this short story takes the time to separate the person from their profession suggests this person is valued for more than what they do. This person has an identity that goes beyond how they make a living. And this will become important later when we come to our last surprise because it focuses on the transformation that takes place in this person. I'll, I'll come back to that. The second noteworthy fact in this short phrase is the Greek word for, the, for merchant is the person's is called emporos. That's the Greek, emporos. Emporos has the connotation of a wholesaler. And it's not exactly a badge of honor in Jewish society. In Jesus' time, being a merchant wasn't that something that people looked up to. And Jesus could have chosen so many other professions to make the point of this parable, so he does so for a reason. Most of us today would miss the surprise because in today's English, merchants are usually considered with general respect and favor. I, I go to the Chamber of Commerce meetings here in Nobles all the time. You meet wonderful, upstanding citizens who care about the culture and the community of Noblesville. But in Jesus' day, they didn't quite have that reputation. When you look up the word emporos, it's con in its biblical context, you find generally negative connotations. The only other exact reference to this word in the New Testament comes in Revelation chapter 18, verse 3 and following. It talks about the kings of the earth who have committed fornication with the whore of the Roman Empire are connected to the merchants of the earth. These emporoi is, are decadent and are enemies of the kingdom of God. That negativity of merchants is also found in the Old Testament. If you read the Greek Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament that was used in Jesus' day, you find that emporoi were the ones who sold Joseph into slavery. They filled Solomon's overextended coffers, and they sell other Israelites into slavery. And then you could come again to 
variations of this word that are also found in the New Testament, the Old Testament. We've got the example of Jesus in the Jerusalem temple in John chapter 2. He throws out the merchants in that temple for making their father's house a marketplace. The most famous use in the Old Testament is Amos, which reads in 8.6, where the prophet accuses the wealthy of buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. I could keep on going, but the point, the subject of this parable is not a hero. He's a middleman who profits from buying products as low as he can and then sells them as high as he can, at the, often at the expense of others. So if you're listening to Jesus' parable, if you're at the feet of Jesus in the original first century setting, you're going to be scratching your head and saying, now, where is he going with this story? I don't want to exactly be emulating a merchant. So that's the first surprise. Now, if you read this parable as an allegory, you'll find all kinds of commentators trying to interpret what that pearl is. And they decode it as something that's one of the most desirable things you could have, or it must symbolize Jesus or the gospel. But that's not actually what the parable says. The kingdom of heaven is not compared to the pearl. It is compared to the merchant who, seeking fine pearls, sells all that he has for one fabulous item. The focus, the second surprise, is on the action. The pearl is about the transformation that takes place in a man who is all about making a profit. It ends up doing a rather foolish thing and sells everything he has for one great thing. According to Pliny, who's a Roman author, naturalist, and philosopher of that century, pearls held the topmost rank among all things of price. They were actually more costly than rubies. They are jewels that the majority of the population of the Roman Empire would have never seen except for in artistic expressions. Pliny and other Latin writers recount the story of Cleopatra that you've heard of, who wagered her lover Mark Antony that she could consume 10 million sectaries at one banquet. Today that would represent about a million dollars. And so for her dessert course, her servants brought before her a single plate with a pool of vinegar in it. And she took off one of her pearl earrings, placed it in that bowl, and watched it dissolve, and then she drank its contents. The merchant sold all that he had, not just for something more valuable. He saw something so wonderful, so beautiful, so amazing, that he put aside all business sense to acquire it. He had to have it. Have you ever felt that kind of passion for anything in your life? The last surprise in this parable is the change, the transformation that takes place in the merchant. The parable suggests he was in search of fine pearls. And so we assume that he was seeking to acquire pearls, to resell at a profit, and continue to prosper. But instead, he changes midstream. And when coming upon the one great pearl, he sells everything he has, which means he ceases to be a merchant. The parable suggests acquiring the kingdom of God involves a transformation in your identity. It involves a radical changing of priorities. In other words, following Jesus changes everything. It reminds us of the words in Matthew 6, where Jesus says, But search, search, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. The Greek word for seek is the same as the one used in this parable. The kingdom of God is not like a pearl. It is like the willingness to change whatever it takes to pursue God's kingdom purposes. You know, this parable reminds me of a story in the New Testament where Jesus has someone who comes to him. Remember that rich young ruler? He wanted to know what good thing he must do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus told him to keep the commandments, of which he answered that he had ever since he was a young boy. And then Jesus said, well, there's something still missing. If you want to be complete, go sell what you own, give to the poor, and come follow me. Now, don't most of us, when we hear that story, we focus on that selling all you have part. 
But we miss out on the good news that's in Jesus' words. Jesus was inviting him to follow him. Jesus was offering him the privilege of sharing in the adventure of living life with God's own son. Well, I know I've not fully integrated the parable of great price in my life. I've not taken the radical step of selling everything I have and pursuing a mission with complete abandon. But there have been times in my life when I felt the call of Jesus so strongly, I had to follow. I never imagined some of these places that I've been taken to. The adventures which forever enriched my life. Following Jesus has placed responsibilities on, on me that I never thought I could handle. It has certainly provided crosses to bear that I would not have chosen. I've felt the passion of that merchant who sold everything he had in order to acquire that one great pearl. And when I follow that passion, that calling, it has brought a sense of purpose grounded in the knowledge that I'm doing exactly what God wants me to be doing right now, right here. So what is the pearl of great price in your life? What passions has God placed in your heart? What need on this earth is God calling you to meet? Well, I confess to you that I am a bit of a shopaholic. Shopping is my vice. We all have them, right? My closet is a little too full of boots, handbags, and clothes. Just ask my son, Xavier, who loves to try on all of my shoes. A few years ago, when the movie came out called Confessions of a Shopaholic, I watched it and I had a laugh at some of the moments in the, in the film where I recall feeling, thinking, I thought, wow, I felt really similar to this before, to the young woman in the story. She and I shared some similar thoughts. In one scene, after having racked up a huge credit card bill, she finds herself in yet another store looking at a green scarf. You can see it in the picture there. She tries to convince herself to walk away, remembering her bills and her debt that were beginning to pile up. But then the mannequin wearing the scarf in the store comes to life and convinces her that this scarf would become the essence of her. It would make her haircut look more expensive. It would bring out the color of her eyes and help her get that next promotion. She would be the girl with the green scarf. Now the very next scene shows our shopaholic whipping out her credit card to pay for the green scarf, but out of the six or eight credit cards she tries, most of them are maxed out. So she eventually runs down the street to a hot dog stand and lies to the people in line saying that she has a family emergency and she needs the remaining $20 right away to have enough to buy the scarf for her dying grandmother. A generous stranger gives her the money. Only we find out later that the stranger is the man she is interviewing with that morning for a new job, who is then quite curious as to what the real story is when she arrives wearing the scarf to the interview. The rest of the movie is a funny but honest look at the young woman's shopping addiction and her trying to overcome her massive amounts of debt and the havoc that it has wreaked on her life. Always wanting the next best thing, she can't help but accumulate and spend in order to get what she wants. And by the way, you can get your own green scarf like the one in the movie for $95 online. I looked. No, I did not buy it. <laughs> for our shopaholic... Clothes, accessories, boots, and handbags are her pearl of great price as she keeps seeking. Those are the things who, that define who she is. And that's not necessarily a healthy or a good thing. That's the challenge of this parable. It raises questions about our own desires and asks, why are we always looking for the next best thing, the better thing? the bucket list item, the latest heart's desire. I know that when life gets hard and I am stressed, I find myself drawn to the same things as our shopaholic, 
perhaps thinking that those things will make life better. But in reality, I know that certain pearls of great price are not worth it, and their luster quickly fades away. We are all searching for something deeper and lasting. The question is, how do we know what that is? And how do we know when we find it? Theologian Paul Tillich has this concept of one's ultimate concern, that thing that we tend to focus on, the one thing that helps define and shape who we are, that which we are always seeking. He calls, he calls us and challenges us that faith should be that ultimate concern. Faith is a total and centered act of the personal self, he says. The act of unconditional, infinite, and ultimate concern. As a seeking college student years ago, Tillich's words spoke to me in deep and profound ways. Faith should be that defining part of who we are as human beings. Particularly as a Christian, the faith we have in Jesus Christ is to be our ultimate concern. Everything else is secondary. Faith in Christ, then, is to be our pearl of great price. This doesn't come without doubts. This doesn't come without the reality that we will seek out other things to fulfill and define us. This does, however, challenge us to be persistent in keeping Christ at the center of our ultimate concern and to open our eyes to what may be the ultimate concern that pearl of great price not only for ourselves, but also for our neighbors. Several years ago, as part of a pastoral leadership program, I traveled to Tijuana, Mexico with a group of clergy colleagues to hear and see firsthand the struggles of those caught up in the immigration crisis. We spent several days at a housing place for men who had been deported. Many had been living, working, and raising their families in the United States for decades, only to be perhaps pulled over for a minor traffic violation and then were deported from the country, leaving their families behind to struggle without them and to figure out what to do next. For these men, their pearl of great price was freedom, safety, being reunited with their families, the promise of a better life. We even met a man who lost his leg trying to escape gang violence in his home country. His pearl of great price was health and a safe place to live and work. For many in our communities, their pearl of great price are the things that many of us take for granted. A roof over our heads, food to eat, health care, security, the love of family, freedom. These are the things that many of our neighbors, our brothers and sisters, go without. So we are presented with two challenges from today's parable. What is your pearl of great price? Number one, what is that thing for which you want to be known? This parable, as Pastor Jerry said, gives us a man, a human being, who seeks out and sells all of his things for this one pearl. It's a man who has a pearl. He knows its value enough that he is able to see it and cancels out all other desires. But we know what our pearl is when we see it. And how do we know when enough is enough? Will we keep shopping around for the better deal or the next best thing? Or are we able to be content with what we have? Upon realizing that our pearl of great price might be education, freedom from harm, our children, justice or equality, relief from hunger or addiction, or the grace of God found in Jesus Christ, we might also realize then that this demands a new way for us to live, that transformation that Pastor Jerry talked about. It challenges us a new way in how we can help others then to seek what really matters to them. 
Challenge number two then is how do we recognize what is of ultimate concern to our neighbors and how do we help foster that desire? Sometimes when we take a look around our world and open our eyes to the vulnerable and the hurting, the tug of the Spirit is so strong that we know without a doubt what we are to do, regardless of whatever sacrifices we might have to make. This was the case for Heidi Baker, also known as Mama Heidi, in 1995 when she felt called to Mozambique at the height of the Civil War to care for the orphans and those cast out of society. Let's take a brief look at her story. They tried to kill me when I first came here. Já lembro Vidal quando tem faca o grafa. Quer me matar? Primeiro vez. He tried to kill me when I first came here. Com grafa. Porque eu sou branca jovem. It's because I'm a white woman that just came and invaded the dump. Agora não há de me matar. Há de me abraçar. In the year 1992, Mozambique had already suffered 11 years of bloody civil war. This war caused 800,000 victims and created thousands of orphans. When Heidi and Roland Baker heard about this tragedy, they made the decision to move to Mozambique and dedicate themselves to helping the orphans. We have 500 kids that live with us. We have eight boys uh, that, that live really with us right in our home and uh, my daughter Crystalyn, our son Elisha he's at university but he's back and forth and so yeah we have a big family <laughs> I, I always um, wanted to look at people from the inside, even though I grew up in a privileged setting overlooking the beach and it was so beautiful. I, I felt like so many people had kind of a plastic outer, outer core and, and I, I wanted to love the unlovely. And so I just prayed, God, let me love the unlovely. Let me, let me sit with the hurting. I read an article to her one day and I said, Heidi, look here. It says here in, in East Africa, they're having a civil war and the communists and the rebels are fighting and it's bloody. I mean, they're killing thousands and thousands of people. They're killing more people than ever got killed in the Vietnam War. It's so evil. The, the violence is so great. The armies are literally blowing up the people that are coming with medicine to help the wounded. That's how drastic it is. And Heidi's first response was, oh, let's go there. <laughs> That's all she needed to know. Let's go there. No, tem camiseta, tem comida. Não quer? Aqui. Vamos juntos. For Mama Heidi, she discovered her pearl of great price to be helping others see their value and worth and belovedness. That call she felt so strongly, let's go there, was her transformational identity as she sought that pearl. In a world where so often we find pearls of great price for so many to be power, money, fame, 
that sense that we have to be right all the time, or even the harm of another. We must begin to reprioritize our lives around those kingdom values of love, self-sacrifice, grace, hope, and peace. Upon finding these pearls of great price, I pray that we would hold on to them at all costs. And by the grace of God, we put them to use to build the kingdom of God right here, right now. May it be so. Amen.